and you'd think that I would listen, but no, I don't listen. So now I'm recording. Welcome to our 244. It's really nice to see everybody tonight. <laughs> Problem with being a man. Men don't listen. Selective hearing. Yeah, when I start mansplaining about mansplaining, that's when it really gets bad. Sorry. I apologize to everyone. Oh my goodness, this is so hard. It looks like the sculpture class that meets on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons will indeed be able to start meeting in person next week, starting on Tuesday. My only problem is that I haven't hired a model yet for that class. We are supposed to do human figure study in that class. And so, you know, hopefully if everything goes good and the stars line up, I will be, um, teaching a class with a nude model standing, sitting, lying in the middle of the class with a COVID mask on. And 10 um, terrified students uh, in the class trying desperately to put clay together to make it sort of look like a human figure. Because that's what I do in the daytime is human figure study. I thought they were moving Coos Bay back into extreme. Well, yeah, that's what we were talking about. Um, but um, the, it's, it was just it's, something I heard. I don't know if it was factual or not. It was a rumor. Well, no, it's it's true for Coos County. They're doing this by county, but the educational um, institutions, for some reason, have special dispensation because they think that uh, the transmission rate is somehow less in schools that we have more control over the people here we can make people wear ppe and behave um that's the that's the idea anyway so um maybe that'll work out for us but zoe is right that you know people left to their own devices don't make good choices and uh it's really bad in the middle of a pandemic when you don't do program compliance you got to wear your mask. You gotta, you know, try another, to not pick like, this thing up. Another big issue I have with like schools reopening right now, as we're moving, being moved back into extreme, is I live again right next to an elementary school. Like I remember again a few months ago, we had an entire class of third graders that had to be quarantined because they were exposed. Oh Those are people's gosh. children. Like last year, one of my classmates he died of influenza. Yes. And that's what people are comparing this to when it is so much worse. It is. And it is definitely worse. But when it comes to the kids, they actually, with the information. I don't care. It's they, people's children. Kids are like, like almost immune to the dang thing. They can get well, it. But they don't, aren't dying from it. And not a single. It doesn't matter if they're not dying with it. The other problem that people don't talk about is the disabilities that people are left with afterward. The immunocompensation they are left with afterward, the lung diseases, the problems. Like there are people who now have like heart disease, who have lung failure, all these problems after getting COVID, but they still live. And, the that's, if about the, COVID. and that's if the hospital bills don't kill you. Can you imagine exactly. how overwhelming that would be for somebody that's a single parent family on, on low income? That would really suck. It really suck if you fell in between where you were between an Oregon healthcare plan and being able to afford good in insurance. Those people are going to fall through the cracks. That's going to put them in even worse debt. Plus, I think the new strain, they're finding that kids get the new strain a lot easier. Yeah, I am. Um... Has anybody got shots? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> I have no. neither. I wish, I hope someday I will get a shot. Yeah. Or two. The people yeah, you know, the people that are going to get the vaccine first are people that work um, on the front lines, like the healthcare, um, people that work in healthcare, um, or uh, people that are immunocompromised. Those are the people that are going to get the vaccine first. Yeah, I think that's right too. The the policemen, the paramedics, the hospital workers, all those people need to have them first. It's going to happen if they get sick and then the rest of us get sick and they'll be sick and they won't be able to take care of us. Right? <laughs> our, our hospital has gotten the vaccine. My mom works at the hospital and she's gotten her first dose. Did she? Good. My, I think my daughter got her first dose. She works at, at a doctor's office in Roseville, California. I think she got her first dose a week or two ago. It was the Pfizer one. She was saying something about Pfizer probably being better than Moderna. Hmm, that's. My, I was talking to my mom about this. Um, she recently got, I think, her first dose, and she thinks that the Moderna one is better over the Pfizer because the Moderna doesn't have to be stored the same way the Pfizer one does. It still has to be stored at like super cold temperatures, but it's slightly more durable. Yeah, it can go anywhere. The other one, there you have to have specialized storage for it. And isn't there only something like a four or five percent difference in between the efficiency? Oh yeah, it's they're they're both going to be effective, but the problem is with the storage and how well it will keep. I was seeing a story of people who were like in a CVS just randomly, and they got called over to get the vaccine because once they open the vial, they can't refrigerate that. They can't put it back in the fridge to save for more people. They have to use that vial that day. So when the pharmacy you know, had more vaccine, but no more people to vaccinate in healthcare. They just did whoever was like in the pharmacy at the time. So but this happened in another state, I believe. So well, that makes more sense than wasting it. Oh. I think that Oregon got some of those too, where there were more than one vaccine in a vial and they were trying to figure out how to work with that. Yeah. Um, at least for, I think one of the vaccines, there's 10 doses worth of vaccine in one vial. I want some. <laughs> uh, chicken hang out around the hospital, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's a fox. 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 Yep. It's gonna be a fox. It kinda looks like an otter right now. Oh, our land. Yeah. It looks better than my otter right now. <laughs> so I heard somebody say that it's time to go eat. And you guys, I'm really sorry about having a class that goes from six to nine o'clock on two nights a week. And, you know, usually I'm dealing with all of the people in housing and they're running over to the cafeteria here and grabbing a bite or something and even bringing it to class because, you know, they're trying to get to a six o'clock class and they don't have time to eat between their sports practice and coming here. So, um, you know, if you need to turn off your camera, or turn off whatever, and, you know, have some dinner, you can do that in the middle of class along with us. It's okay. No harm, no foul. Um, we're kind of casual about how we do things in this class. So uh, I, I just want you to be able to take care of your needs as they come up. Okay, I've got my torso and arms on here. I'm going to try to weld this stuff together to see if I can make it stick. And then I'm going to actually try to do show and tell so that we can you know, see what a roughed out sculpture is. I just lit that torch and then I thought, am I about to burn down my computer monitor? <laughs> Which pointed <laughs> in the wrong direction. <laughs> I'd be oh, burning man. myself. What is, is that a boob laying in the background? Is that getting, that's getting welded back on, huh? Looks like a breast. Uh, this person over here? Um, no, it, I was just talking about the pieces and parts you have laying there. Oh, I have two breast forms that are over here. <laughs> Poor little disembodied breast, breast forms, but I have to work. 
I, on general things like the just the gesture of the torso and the way things are draping right now. And so I'm kind of just, um, this is unkind. This is like surgery. I mean, this is meatball surgery here, kind of putting these things together. So um, I see the shape going on there. It's triage and then it gets better. Um, no, I, I could see what's going on there. It's going to be cool. Okay, well, I'm, I've got a head and I've got two breast forms, but I'm going to see if I can carefully pick this thing up and maybe weld my arms and torso on from the underside or the backside. And then we'd have something to talk about, I guess. And so I've got my little torch. I'm always asking you guys when you are in the studio here to like not reach across the torch to grab the tools out of the tool bin um and now we don't have that except now i can i'm not actually i'm on i'm way underneath the torch but it looks really bad from this angle but coming to you okay so i'm picking up my sculpture and i'm turning it over to try to find all of the cracks and crevices that need welding and then i'm going to be eight seconds in the flame and then just plunge the um the blade in to get a weld happening. When you hear me screaming, it's because the wax is melting through the crack and coming out the other side and running on my hand. And there's nothing more fun than hot wax on you. Um, that's a nasty thing. But I digress. So when I'm, you know, roughing out the sculpture, I have to be gentle with my hands, give lots and lots of support to the sculpture so that it doesn't um, fall apart. When it does fall apart, I try to stifle my screams as I try to put it back together again and, uh, you know, stick more wax into places and weld it in or do other kinds of things to try to, um, stabilize the patient we're always trying to stabilize the patient here stabilize for transport this was a beautiful little sculpture before i started to ruin it um i think i've got something that i can talk about here. So let's see. I'm going to hold this so that looking at the camera, it's going to sit um, kind of like this. Um, it's going to sit flat on its bottom and legs and stuff. And the hands are also sitting flat on the tabletop or on the deck. And so I'm having to try to replicate a uh, kind of a sloopy gesture to the figure because this person is really bending sideways. And so I'm trying to capture that sideways movement of the figure moving in that direction. And so I have to kind of do all kinds of checks from all different sides to see how that's working out for us and um, make adjustments and carve it and sculpt it better as I go. I don't have the head on yet, but at least I've got and I know this kind of looks like one of those segmented figures that you would get at an art supply store that you would use as your basic, you know, art model, those wooden segmented figures. Um, and that's kind of fun. Uh, those are abstractions of a human form too. And so this feels really much like that. If I was, if, if my aesthetic uh, inside my brain was about abstraction, you know, I would be just happy to leave this like this and cast it like this and do abstract figures, but I can't leave it alone. I have obsessions. I want things to have a naturalistic representational feel about the, you know, having forms that are well integrated and that flow one into the other to have real facial features and all that kind of stuff, real details. And so because of that, I will never be, um, uh, successful as an artist because I'm so old school and tradition bound and all that kind of stuff. At least that's what they told me in grad school when they mercilessly um, didn't like my sculpture because it was too nice, too old fashioned, too much about tradition. 
and I don't listen to people because that's how I am. I guess that's why I wound up in Coos Bay, mm. <laughs> where other people don't listen to people. <laughs> We're all a bunch of rugged individualists here. We don't like to be told what to do. We're going to do it the way we want to do it. Does that sound familiar to anybody with an earshot? You were just checking to see if I was listening, weren't you? I don't know. I don't even know if you're a Kuzbanian or not. Well, no, not really. But yeah, you one, of the, one of the biggest mistakes that I made that I, that I didn't see until later, you told me about it. I'm like, no, no, no. And then it was like, God, he was right. <laughs> no, God, no, that's that's terrible to think, to say he was right. We'll, I'll never live that one down. Okay, I'm trying to do something with this figure. Uh, well, I'm going to try to weld that head on. I've got the head on, and it, of course, is at another jaunty angle to the rest of the sculpture. And so I'm going to try to get it established and then deal with it. That's um, that's what we do. We try to get it roughed out, get it stuck on, get things stuck together, and then fix it. Um, and I keep going back to the idea of a uh, college writing class where you have to write and you have to, you know, you know, develop an outline, rough it out, and then come back and do your revisions and your editing. And everybody thinks that that's horrible and they hate that, but that's what life is. I mean, that's what we do in all of our jobs and everything else. We um, have to kind of, when you're doing anything that's creative, you have to rough it out and then revise it so that it's professional. Um, the only place you don't do that is on an assembly line someplace. We don't have a whole lot of assembly lines anymore because we've done a really good job of deindustrializing the country and shipping lots of jobs overseas. Don't get me started because I've got lots of, lots of complaints. I got lots of complaints around about this stuff. Anyway, I think that a lot of the, um, uh, the outrage and the resentment um, of working class people who um, are Trump supporters and whatnot is a lot of it is based on the economy and the idea that we have, you know, done away with a lot of you know, working class jobs and that we've only got a service sector that's left. Um, there's still some manufacturing in the country and that's good, but gosh, we've overseas a lot of manufacturing jobs. And that has changed the way that America works uh, for a lot of folks. And uh, it, it has political ramifications and, you know, super cultural ramifications. It's funny, like, I thought about that, a similar thing. A lot of those jobs that are being shipped overseas are jobs that are oh, they're necessary to society, but we don't value you as a person to do it. So it's necessary, but we don't want to pay you to do it. So we're going to pay someone less who is even more desperate than you are. Yeah. I've like been... people shit on like McDonald's workers and fast food people, but they still want to get McDonald's and get fast food, but do not value the people who make the, who do that job. Yeah. Well, and we all want cheap stuff. You know, we want to go to Walmart and buy cheap stuff. And it does cost more if we pay somebody, you know, a union wage and, and produce it in this country. And manufacturers, ca capitalists all, you know, have figured that out that we can get much cheaper stuff if it's manufactured in a low wage country. And, uh, you know, we can import all this stuff. And unfortunately, that's what's happened over the last 30 or 40 years, um, the deindustrialization of the country, which is well, a I think, I think when they when they can make a product for less than $20 and they turn around and sell it for 200 that's just rape. That's rape in both directions to us and to the people making it. I don't think it's right to take advantage of them. Right. Well, and you know, this, and even, 
this even extends to the sculpture industry. If you think of art, nobody thinks of art as an industry. But when I was showing you guys some of those um, websites and, and uh, examples and stuff, and a lot of that stuff was being cast in China or you know around the other side of the Pacific Rim, where um, wages are a lot lower and there's no you know health and safety requirements, regulations, or benefits. Um, yeah, a lot of that bronze sculpture can be made really cheap and then shipped over here and sold, sold in galleries or skip the gallery part because, you know, you can just sell it online now through Alibaba. And, uh, you know, it, it changes the whole way that um, commerce works. The old um, models of commerce, you know, brick and mortar um, art galleries and that kind of thing, you know, have given way to... Um, marketing everything online these days, um, it's very different and very difficult to be an artist, um, especially a bronze caster or a sculptor, because you are, you're manufacturing something with sculpture. You're using manufacturing processes, whether you're doing bronze casting or making it out of other um, uh, materials, um, you're making stuff. And so you are actually doing manufacturing. And so we've got you know, the kinds of costs, uh, baseline costs in this country are different and higher than other places. Um, I went to work at the Walla Walla Foundry in Walla Walla, Washington. They were casting lots and lots of sculpture and shipping it back to the East Coast, to New York City, to the Pace and Marlboro Galleries in New York City. And the artists in New York, uh, the famous, you know, top flight artists, would even just fly out to Walla Walla, Washington to supervise the production of some of their sculptures. It was just cheaper because, you know, you can pay people in a small town like Coos Bay to do this stuff. And we just don't have enough entrepreneurs who are coming out here to open those kinds of mom and pop shops to be able to do it. And unfortunately, frankly, <laughs> um, we are still so far off the I-5 corridor that it's really hard to compete with anything that is on the I-5 corridor in terms of um, transportation and delivery of stuff. Speaking of mom and pop places, have any of you ever gone to that place? I don't think it's, I'm pretty sure it's not there anymore. Um, in Newport, it used to be, what was it? Milo's Mark IV, I think. It was next door to that. It was called the Wood Gallery. And a lot of the sculptures in there were completely made out of wood, like clocks. It was really cool. Ah, sounds cool. I keep thinking that when I retire, I'm probably going to try to open up a small gallery, perhaps, you know, in a downtown location and, uh, you know, make my sculpture, cast my bronze in the back room, and, you know, be sitting there full time doing this, you know, doing this sculpting stuff, you know, in the front room and people will come in and they will ooh and ah at the finished bronze sculptures. And they'll see me kind of putting around with these wax things. And they'll, you know, the whole process will be right there. Um, that's one dream. That's one possibility. <laughs> hey, Cameron, what are you making? You got a gorilla or Sasquatch? Who, who's working on that? Cameron. Cameron, I, I, I got to look at Cameron's. I can't see his thing. Let's see. All right. I'm going to even pin him so I can right. really see what he's looking at. It just looks like a potato with arms, like kind of. But it's supposed to be like a chimpanzee gorilla. Like, okay. I'm kind of debating on which one to lean more towards. I was right like, it's, it's definitely either a gorilla or a Sasquatch from yeah. just your rough that you got going so uh, hey it's gonna take a lot of work to chisel it down but yeah like hopefully get there soon <laughs> so cameron the limbs are really thick and i know that you know it's going to be painful to try to um scrape things down and get them thinner but it's the proportions of the limbs that really determine whether it is a you know thick like a gorilla or thinner like a chimpanzee or even thinner like a spider monkey you know, is just pretty much how thin each one of those limbs are, how thin the torso is. And, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, be a, I'm not trying to advocate thinness. I'm just saying that there's a direct correlation between the, the way that the proportions are in the sculpture and proportions are height to width 
and thickness. You know, it's the relative thickness and size of all the uh, of all the features that make up the proportions of a piece. So you'll be doing a lot of carving on that to get those to be chimpanzee arms instead of the gorilla arms that they're sort of at right now. Yeah, Sorry. so like a partially, I think at first I was going to go chimpanzee, and then like I started getting bigger and bigger, and I was like, maybe it might be a gorilla. It'd be a little easier to uh, get it carved down to more accurate dimensions that way. So if I tell you that that piece is going to cost you like 40 or $60 because it's bigger, does that give you any incentive to carve it back down a little smaller? <laughs> uh, I, I could still pitch out the 40, 50 bucks for it. Well, 40, 60 bucks for it, but. Oh, okay. All the better. the uh, height, like what, around what height were we supposed to be at? I was hoping to keep this thing somewhere, you know, around six inches tall to eight inches tall as a maximum. So I'm going to reach over for this sculpture right here. This one that I was demonstrating last week, you know, it stands at about 12 inches tall, including the um, outstretched upraised hand. The one that I am sculpting on today is about four, four to five inches tall. And you can kind of see in proportion to my hands what the height of this sculpture is going to be. It's almost miniature. It's a very small sculpture. It's a very small figure. And I know you guys all hate me for this, but I've been doing this for 35 years, so I can crank these out pretty fast with having to, without having to make a lot of changes. Um, and I know my way around this thing. It ain't my first rodeo. So um, there's all of that. Um, you got, it's going to go slower for you guys because you're working out a lot of the bugs as we're doing this. You're learning what the proportions are. You're having to kind of teach yourselves how to sculpt in wax. And so you've got warm wax that we're sculpting with and you can push it into cracks and stuff. Uh, you got cold wax that will actually hold its shape. And that's the difference between body temperature wax that's 100 degrees, 98.6, and room temperature, which is 60 degrees, there's a 40 degree difference there. And it really does change the strength of the wax. Um, I'm gonna light this up again. So is two and a quarter inches too small? No, there's no such thing as too small. Okay. Um, so this is the start to my fox. Oh, I gotta, I gotta look, I gotta find you again. Where are you? Oh, no. Who's talking to me? Kylie? Kylie. Kylie. Okay, yep. I've got to see this one, if I can pin you up here so I can see it. There we go. Yes, that's the fox. Okay, fantastic. I see the tail. I see the front legs. I see the head. It's beautiful. Okay. Yeah, and that's a roughed out figure. That's a roughed yep. out form. Perfect. Yep. Beautiful. That's exactly where we start off with and where you need to be. This one kind of looks like Nessie, the Loch Ness monster. Yes. Yay, Nessie. I love Nessie. <laughs> Doing fine. So do you have any photographic reference to look at? Yeah, I have them on my phone. Okay. Um, you guys with your phones, you absolutely kill me because um, you have to keep reaching over and refreshing your phone and you get wax residue all over the phone. And it's only, you know, three inches by four inches. So if, if you've got any kind of access to a printer, do try to print it out on paper because a big paper thing to look at is a lot easier than the phone screen. Um, I got to get some gin. Look at that gin she's drinking there. It's actually wine. Oh, good for you. Good on you. All right. That's pretty cool. All right. Well, let's see. I'm going to remove some of these pins and come back to my um, thing here. What was I doing? Oh, yeah. I was going to weld this neck on better. Okay, so heating up my knife, and then I'm going in for the weld. Okay, and I will continue trying to think if there's any other kind of little tiny but effective heat source that is not an open flame to do this with, but something that would be electric powered um, and that has kind of an electric burner on it would be, would be the way to go. Um, Otherwise, you're, you don't have enough heat to get the job done. Usually, if you can have a, oh, I know, um, soldering irons, little tiny soldering irons, uh, wood burning kits, those kinds of things that are electric that you can plug in, a soldering iron would be an excellent thing to um, 
be able to plug in. You're gonna have to put it on a wood block or something to protect your table. Um, but it's something that could, um, you know, dab onto the wax and then um, create a weld zone in the wax. Hello. Well, I see that we are, you know, past seven o'clock now. And, you know, I don't know if you guys like being online forever or not on these classes. I usually try to do, you know, half hour or an hour of, of presenting. And then I try to sit at the tables and go around and sit kind of with you guys and try to help people individually with stuff. Um, it looks like everybody has kind of really gotten into the routine and rhythms of sculpting. It's kind of a quiet, solitary um, process for the most part. Um, and I may kind of be wrapping things up here on the live portion of this thing for this evening. Do I, I will take any kind of questions or criticism at this point though. And I, you won't hurt my feelings if you're thinking that, if you need to say something like, I don't feel like I'm getting enough attention from you, Mr. Fritz, or um, I need more of this or that or the other thing. You know, if you need more demonstrations, um, if you need more, just kind of um, me hanging out with you because it gives, it provides moral support and that kind of stuff. You know, I can stay and I can, I can keep doing this. If on the other hand, you're getting tired of my ass and you want me to wrap things up so you go on and do other things, and come back to this on the weekends, um, in the evenings when you have time, that's fine. Oh, I have to tell you that we're not having class on Monday because it's Martin Luther King holiday. And so there, it's a federal holiday, no class on Monday. Um, so the next time we will meet will be a week from tonight, next Wednesday night. And we'll see how that goes in terms of you guys making progress on your sculptures. Um, left up to your own devices by then. Um, so having now told you that, are there any questions, comments, anything that I can do for you in terms of, uh, you know, for the good of the order? No, nope. I'm going to go grab something to eat. I'll see y'all later. Okay. So Hunter. long, PC. Hey, Hunter, have you gotten to the wings yet on your Pegasus? Uh, I I tried uh, doing them um, um, like at one point, but um, it's something I, I figured that it would be better if I worked the um, proportions on the body first before I go to the wings. Um, yeah, it's like because I feel like the wings is something that I would have to put on like last I, or I, pretty close I to last. I agree 100 percent. That's actually what I did with mine. I was just wondering if you got the wings yet and if you had any tricks you could share. Because I'm freaking wrestling my <laughs> sculpture so hard. I mean, when I did them the first time, I just, I just met, get a, I just got it like a bit of wax. Uh, I flattened it out in a pancake, and then I, I used like one of the, I used the, the, um, this tool, the one that the two bladed tool, um, and I, and I kind of cut the. I cut the the pancake into slice into thinner slices, and those made um, sort of like wings. Well, I got the wings on. It's it's more or less. I'm trying to get the feathers and the and then all, like finish so I can start working on the finer detail. But it's uh, I'm, like I said, I'm just wrestling. I was just wondering if you were there yet, and if you had any tips and tricks there. Uh, I had a question about um, how do you recommend getting the wax to be a little smoother because mine is starting to get a little flaky. I don't know if you can see it. You really can't. I'm do I'm trying to do a teeny tiny version of the sword, um, but it's starting to get a little. It's it's still wax, but it's kind of crusty, and I want to smooth that down so it's like it looks better, and so I can see the details that I'm trying to like carve into it. Okay, that of course is the next thing. Um, and you're not gonna like this answer, but um, we, we're gonna have to use a petroleum-based solvent for that. I usually use paint thinner 
And so I've got paint thinner, of course, here in the studio, and I can make little cups of paint thinner available for you guys that you could take from this place. Um, if you have paint thinner, um, <laughs> watch me go through the list of things that are illegal, lighter fluid, um, kerosene, um, that kind of stuff. We take a little bit of that on a piece of paper towel and rub it on the surface of the wax. And it's a solvent so that it dissolves the wax just on the surface and it polishes the wax and gives you a super smoothed out kind of finish to your wax. And so, yeah, paint thinner, um, kerosene, uh, lighter fluid, something like that. So, um, do you have anything like that at home? Uh, would acetone work? Possibly, I've never tried acetone. It is a solvent and you can give it a try. Um, um, so otherwise, I'm going to try to come up with some little containers with lids on them and see if I can part out some paint thinner that can be picked up next week for that. We may have to just kind of deal with the um, nasty texture for maybe one more week until I can get paint thinner to you. It's available at, you know, Walmart, Bymart, um, and all the lumber yards and home centers in town but they sell it by the quart. And so it's always gonna cost you $7.95 for a quart of paint thinner that you're never gonna use other than for this job. So I think I'm gonna to try to find some small plastic bottles that I can um, get you a little hit of paint thinner in. It's also flammable, so we have to watch the flammability of it. I don't want you bursting into flame. So I have a question pertaining to that. You said it petroleum based, is there a particular reason why petroleum based like wouldn't what why wouldn't it like denatured alcohol or something work alcohol is kind of a solvent for wax it would work if you guys have some alcohol in your medicine cabinet give that a try I, I um, mean like denatured alcohol which is basically jet fuel okay yeah um most alcohols um that we get are like uh 60 70 percent alcohol there's a 90 percent rubbing alcohol that you can get um and sometimes i use the liquor out of my liquor cabinet but i've only got 100 proof stuff so it's only 50 percent alcohol um the alcohol and water content is a big deal because you need more alcohol to be a good solvent for the wax um, alcohol is not as good a solvent as paint thinner or kerosene, those um, dissolve the wax a little better and a little faster. But with repeated applications, even alcohol will do the job for you. Hey, Fritz. Yeah. Do these ears look pretty... Um, even. Even and like not too big for this body? They look a good size for that body. Some more refinement will happen. And yeah. When, once you get uh, more pictures of a fox and stuff available, we're going to look at refining the shape of the ears and maybe the size of the ears. Okay. Um, the fox's nose tapers quite a bit. Yeah, so that's why that, I have such a, a solid chunk up here because I'm going to taper it out. Yeah, okay, that'll be good. Okay, real good. And have you started to build up more of that breast fur that you were talking about before? Um, I wanted to connect my legs Oh, okay. um, as best as I could in here before I added that big part of that breast, just so I know that they're connected okay. fairly securely. And you're at home, so you can use open flame and stuff, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Do you I actually, have... I have a torch. Okay. Do you have paint thinner and that kind of stuff at home? Or yeah. alcohol? Okay. <laughs> Try to remember, here's a really important hint, keep the flame and the paint thinner separated from each other okay don't I have open like flame. My house. okay because you can uh, set yourself on fire or set yep. your sculpture on fire if you've got open flame nearby and oh, you're yeah. using the flammable liquids so watch that try to keep them separate we try to do that on purpose okay <laughs> <laughs> all right I think on that happy note, I'm going to show you guys my sculpture one more time. If I can find my little, there's, there's me. So I'm going to pin the video to me and I've, I've stuck this thing together. I've got, you know, a little thing that has its kind of jaunty little um, uh, lean to it and everything, but you can see how 
these things get to be really damn complicated from all these different sides. And, but that's a roughed out, roughed out version of the pose and the sculpture. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna be refining for the next several weeks on that particular piece. I'm gonna build a sculpture out of this larger sculpture too. So I'll have a couple of them going on the side for myself. I think it's time to call it a night for me and for the rest of you guys. So I'm gonna say goodbye. We won't see each other again until Wednesday. So, um, you know, have a good Martin Luther King day, have a great weekend, um, stay dry. And if we, the sun does come out like it did today, enjoy the sun while you can. And I'll see you again next Wednesday night. So goodbye for now. Bye now. Did, did you take uh, attendance tonight? You know, I didn't take attendance. I should. Yes, I did. Yeah, okay. I, okay. I got you guys. I was just making sure. So which one are you? Which one am I? You're, you're Zach. I'm Zach. I know Zach. I, okay. I have been my whole life. I gotcha. Okay. <laughs> I'll see you guys next time. Yep. Yep. So,